Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Destiny Lost by M.D. Cooper. Narrated by Christine Vam, a SAG-AFTRA member. An Unexpected Cargo Stellar date June 30th, 8927. Adjusted years. Location, Coburn Station Trio. Region, Trio System. Silstrand Alliance Space. Sarah slammed the shooter down with a triumphant grin and watched with reddened eyes as the man from Thoria reached for his next glass. Around them, the crowd chanted their names as money changed hands. Her opponent downed his drink and tossed the glass onto the table where it rolled against the two dozen empty shooters between them. With a wave of his hand and an unappealing grin, he indicated that the floor was hers. She took a deep breath to steady herself, chanting an internal mantra of, Just one more. Just one more. The act of raising her arm caused Sarah to sway in her seat, the smell of bodies pressed close around not helping her deepening nausea. The Thorian saw her hesitation, and his grin grew wider. Ready to give up? He slurred, his putrid breath washing over her. Sarah didn't reply, only fixed him with a steely glare. At least she hoped it was a steely glare. And grasped the glass in her fist, throwing it back without further hesitation. The alcohol washed down her throat like fire, and her tongue felt swollen in its wake. If she didn't know better, she'd assume the bartender had poured a stiffer drink, she set the glass down and took slow, deep breaths, using all her concentration to keep the fire in her stomach and veins under control. The Thorian grunted and stared at the row of shots before him, likely deciding which one to pick up. Finally selecting his drink, he grabbed it with a swift flourish and raised it high to throw it back. In his current state, the gesture failed miserably, and the drink splashed across his face. His features crumpled in confusion, and his arms rotated slowly as he slid sideways out of his chair to the floor. No one attempted to catch him, and the man's head hit the deck plate with a solid crack. Cheers and grumbles erupted around her as Sarah was declared the winner. The victors were paid out, and the losers turned to the bar for another drink. In the midst of the post-contest exchange, one voice rose above the others. A short but well-built man in a dirty ship suit pushed to the front of the crowd. Cheater. She had to cheat. There's no way that waif could drink Greg under the table. He slammed his hands on the table, bent over, his face inches from Sarah's. You used nano to clear the alcohol from your bloodstream. Most people had some of the tiny nano machines in their body. It was nearly impossible not to. They were almost as common as bacteria. A person's nano was controlled by their internal computer, or AI, if you had the money or influence to hire one. Sarah's nano could clear her bloodstream with ease, though that wasn't a fact she advertised. It took a lot of nano to filter that much booze over such a short period, a lot more than a simple freighter captain should possess. Sarah worked her mouth for a moment, making sure it would respond the way she wanted it to. I did not have the bartender do a check. The words were slurred, but understandable. Bartenders on Coburn Station were not allowed to let their patrons get too drunk, an ordinance they rarely enforced. They had scanners on hand that could do a blood alcohol level check and determine, based on that person's size and metabolic rate, if they were too inebriated to have another round. The bartender had already stepped into the crowd, eager to do whatever it took to avoid a fight on his shift. He pressed the scanner against Sarah's wrist and took samples of her blood for the reading. She's pissed, he said as he straightened. Consistent with the amount of time she's been slugging them back. Smirking, he turned back to the bar. Those shooters are only a third of what she's had tonight, too. The winners cheered all the louder, and the losers ceased their grumbling. Everyone knew that bartenders altered their scanners, so they could give people more liquor than they should. 
If it said she was drunk, then she should be totally pissed. One of these days, the losers aren't going to care what the scan says and take their satisfaction out of your hide, Helen admonished in Sarah's mind. Sarah sent her internal AI a mental shrug. Helen didn't like it when Sarah drank. She complained it upset the chemical balance of Sarah's body in a way that made the AI feel weird. Sarah wasn't sure how that was possible. Not that it would change her behavior. She liked the feeling of chemical imbalance. My hide's been through worse. I know. I've been there each time. Doesn't mean I want a repeat. You know how disconcerting I find it when you get hurt that badly. Helen could be annoying at times with her mothering, but Sarah knew that her AI's concern was genuine. Pulling her thoughts from the familiar debate, Sarah looked around the bar. To smooth things over, the winners were buying the losers around. Sarah had put a hundred SIL credits down on herself and collected three hundred back. The odds had been stacked nicely against her. Betting was illegal in Sill Strand Alliance space, so money always changed hands in cash. The prohibition didn't seem to diminish the illegal activity. It just meant no one had to pay taxes on their winnings. Sarah thought about that for a minute. Maybe that was why it was illegal. Officials probably liked to gamble tax-free, too. Stuffing the hard-earned money into an inside pocket on her leather jacket, she rose slowly, nearly teetering over at the last moment. A steady hand appeared under her elbow, and Sarah turned to see the dark, smiling face of Cargo. Good haul on that, Captain. He guided her out of the bar and into the bustling main corridor of the station's promenade. I made a couple hundred credits on your drinking skill. It's good to be useful. Sarah slurred, as Cargo led her toward a small coffee shop, which was renowned for its after-drunk sober-up brew. Once inside, Sarah ordered two of their strongest and let Cargo wait at the counter for the order. Her leather clothing squeaked noisily as she collapsed into a chair. Cursing the cafe's bright lights, she leaned back with a hand over her eyes, praying for a power outage. You're not masking the squeak. What gives? Sarah asked her AI. It's what you get for drinking. I can't deal with two organic peculiarities at once. If you drink, I won't mask your clothing's noise. Take your pick. Helen was really on the warpath, determined to make Sarah suffer. Thank God Cargo had shown up. Her first mate knew she liked to get one last round in at a bar before they left a station. Okay, maybe more than just a round. He often would find her and bring her back to the ship before she was too far gone. Sarah splayed her fingers and looked through them to see Cargo returning with an insufferable grin on his face. He had a coffee for himself and two of the sober-up drinks for her. He set them on the table and pushed them toward her, his smile widening. I bet those are going to taste horrible. Sarah stuck her tongue out as she leaned forward to pick one up. Prolly. You should have let me know you were going to get into another drinking contest, Cargo said, and took a drink of his own beverage. I would have had more cash on hand and made a larger wager. I'm sorry. I didn't think to let you know so you could sate your gambling needs, Sarah said while delivering another sour look. My gambling habit doesn't have the unpleasant side effects of your station drinking binges. Sarah eyed him blearily over the rim of her cup. What side effects are those? The first day of any trip. You're not exactly sunshine and roses the day after a binge. Am I ever? Cargo paused, appearing to ponder the statement with great cogitation. Her mind echoed with the light, watery sound of Helen laughing at Cargo's pause. Sarah scowled and swatted at him. Thanks. He gestured with a nonchalant wave toward the second cup, indicating she get to it. Sarah had already used her nano to clear most of the alcohol from her bloodstream and contain it for the next time she visited the head. However, Cargo didn't know she could do that, and she needed to keep up appearances. She raised the cup to her lips and took a long pull of the vile liquid anyway. She didn't want to seem ungrateful. After downing it, she leaned back in her chair, feeling much steadier than when she first sat down. All things considered, it's not a bad bit of extra credit to finish the visit with. 
she said and patted her pocket. Cargo grunted. One day you'll run out of people who haven't seen you win a drinking contest, and then what will you do for fun? Dunno. Guess I'll have to find a new way to fleece the common man. Cargo laughed heartily in response. Several minutes later, with Sarah moving under her own power, they made their way down the promenade and onto the commercial dock front. There was just as much traffic here, but of a different sort. Cargo transports trundled down the deck plate and service trucks were everywhere, delivering supplies or repair equipment. Sabrina was in berth 724 Station South. Long before she could see the ship around the curve of the docks, Sarah could hear Thompson's voice berating some poor cargo handlers. The echoing shouts eventually resolved into words, and Sarah hid a smile behind her hand as they approached. You lazy dolts. Can't you even lift a crate? I've seen hundred-year-old bots do a better job than you oafs. If you drop one more container, I'll take it out of your scrawny, malnourished hides. Now get to it. I don't have all day. Thompson was a large, blonde man who had been her supercargo for over six years. To avoid confusion with cargo, they just called him the super. He wasn't a very outgoing man, mostly taken to brooding and stumping about the ship. But his attention to detail made him a good crew member. Combined with his size and skill with a pulse rifle, that made him the right sort of super for Sabrina. How's the last shipment? Sarah asked when she and Cargo reached the ship. Fine, if these morons can manage to hold on to an effing handle. Thompson tossed the two dock workers a contemptuous glare. Don't know why they insist on using humans for this. Either way, we'll be loaded up with plenty of time to spare. Don't worry, Captain. Good to hear, Cargo said. Send the final docks up to me on the bridge when you're done. Thompson nodded and turned back to the handlers as another crate slipped from their grasp. God's great black space. What is wrong with you two? Is this your first day on the job? I told you I was going to take it out of your hide and now I am. Which one of you wants to get your ear ripped off? Somehow I don't think that is helping them with their work. Cargo laughed. Yeah, but I bet it makes him feel a lot better. Sarah grinned. I'll see you later, Captain. I've got to wash the smell of that bar you were in off me before my shift starts. Sarah took a deep breath. Dunno, I kind of like that malty musk on you. In that case, I'm going to take an even longer shower. Cargo laughed and walked onto the ship. Sarah stuck her tongue out at him and walked over to an inspection port to admire the sleek lines of her girl. Sabrina was not a regular boxy freight hauler, having started her life as a pleasure yacht. Her previous owner had fallen on hard times and lost possession of the ship in an outer system. Sabrina had needed repairs, and the local shipyard, where she had been in storage for owed taxes, didn't have the funds to make them. So she sat for 90 years before Sarah found her. With a hundred years of service before being impounded, she was getting on, but that didn't diminish the impact Sarah felt when she first laid eyes on the ship. There was an influential man who owed Sarah a favor or two, and she got him to give her the money to buy the ship and furnish it with the necessary repairs. The finer aspects of the yacht's interior had been stripped out long before Sarah saw Sabrina, but it was the size of the vessel and the engines that mattered. This ship had the room to haul cargo and the power to do so quickly. There were some other modifications that had been made, but like her advanced nano, Sarah didn't advertise those. She noted with approval that the damage they had suffered on their last run had been repaired. They had been parked in a planetary ring, moving along with the flow of the rocks and ice, when a stray rock had damaged the port sensor array and left a long rent across a goodly portion of the ship. However, the profit from the questionable cargo, which had put them there in the first place, more than paid for the repairs. Thompson let loose some final curses as the dock workers finished loading the last crate. She turned to watch with a smile. The dock workers were visibly trembling as they got on their cart and drove off. Sarah returned to viewing her ship. She enjoyed these final quiet moments alone before going on board and filling out departure docks. These last few minutes when it was just her, Sabrina's sleek hull, and the call of empty space. 
She could forget her past, previous failures. Here she was a good captain. Sabrina was prosperous, and she had a good crew. Her reverie was interrupted by a stinging slap on her butt, and Sarah turned to see her pilot, Cheeky, standing behind her. She wore a coy smile, and her hands were resting on tilted hips. One day, I'll get you to give me some of that love and you lavish on Sabrina, Cheeky said. One day, I'll get you neutered to save us all a lot of hassle. Sarah rubbed her stinging butt. Cheeky could really deliver a good slap. She found herself becoming aroused as she looked at her pilot. Cheeky was an attractive woman who wore as little clothing as local law or custom would allow. On Coburn, that meant she wore little more than three triangles of cloth, her shoes, and a purse. Sarah shook her head to clear her mind. Cheeky also had altered glands that could put out much higher levels of pheromones than any human should be allowed to. Make sure you shut that off and take a long shower. You know what happened last time your love smell filtered through the ship. We all had a good time. Cheeky wiggled her hips suggestively and blew her captain a kiss as she walked up the ramp. From behind, it was obvious why Cheeky had the name she did. Sarah found herself wondering if it was a conscious effort to walk like that or if the woman had resorted to surgery. Following her pilot onto the ship, Sarah's internal AI flashed a notification that they had made a secure connection to the ship's private net. Sarah checked the ship's general status and greeted its AI. Good evening, sweetie. How are you holding together? Sarah asked Sabrina. Well enough, though I take offense to the question, how else would I be holding together? The ship's mental tone conveyed annoyance. Sabrina had been in a strange mood as of late. Sarah chose to ignore the reply and smiled up at the nearest observation camera. As Helen passed her authentication token to the bridge's net, Sarah checked in, finding Cargo already working on departure paperwork. He must have decided to skip the shower. Station give us our departure time yet? 0900 ship time tomorrow. His mental tone was relaxed. He enjoyed the little details of running the ship. Sarah preferred to sit in her captain's chair and give orders. Everything delivered and stowed? She could imagine him flipping through the plaz sheets, checking them against the records logged in their databases before he answered. Cargo hated making mistakes. Just one package left. There was a significant pause. Sarah could feel his mental discomfort even over the net. It's from one of Cade's people here. Cade? Why didn't I know about this? Sarah asked Cargo and Helen. It came on the list when we were out, Helen supplied. Cargo muttered something rude and the bridge's net flashed with an image of Cargo's avatar doing something very unpleasant to a representation of Cade. At least we're delivering it at the regular drop point with the rest of his stuff. There's no extra trip. The regular drop point was an out-of-the-way FTL jump point that Cade's people used for trading with other ships, his people being a pirate organization known as the Mark. Most of their people and ships were somewhat less than welcome at the more reputable stations, such as Coburn. They never can schedule things ahead of time, Sarah sighed. They're not exactly an ahead-of-time sort of organization. Sarah told Cargo she'd be making the rounds and pass the active monitoring to the bridge's net to Helen. When Sabrina had been a private yacht, the main deck was where the owners presumably threw their parties and spent most of their time. Now it was the freight deck. The cargo hatch was on the port side, and from there Sarah walked into the main corridor, which ran from the bow to the stern engine shielding. The various freight holds were located off this corridor. Some had normal air and gravity, some were refrigerated, and some had low or even no gravity. Also along the corridor were the lifts and ladders to the other decks. Sarah walked toward the bow of the ship and slid into one of the vertical ladder shafts, which ran through all the decks. From there, she opened an access hatch to a maintenance tube. Inside the hatch were some knee and shoulder pads that she slipped on. It wouldn't do to scuff her leather. The tube ended in a sealed inspection port. Sarah opened it and peered out at the newly installed sensor equipment. The workmanship looked good. 
Everything was straight and attached firmly. The exterior indicators all showed green. Beyond the array, Sarah could see the space elevator that carried cargo and people between the surface and the station. Seeing it reminded her how far humanity had fallen from the glory it once held. Millennia ago, when humanity had first set out to cross the stars, they had no faster than light technology. Interstellar travel was made possible only by utilizing massive fuel scoops. Ships had vast electrostatic funnels that spread for kilometers in front of them and allowed the gathering and compression of interstellar heavy hydrogen. The hydrogen, typically deuterium and tritium, was burned in nuclear fusion reactors to produce the thrust that pushed the ships between the stars. Journeys between the stars took decades, or even centuries. With the considerable effort and expense required to get to even the nearest stars, humanity strove to make the most of all available resources. Technology and engineering made impressive advances as societies demanded better use of raw materials. The space elevator stretching from Coburn Station down to Trio was an example of the different sort of technology humans used to have. In present times, few worlds could afford to build elevators to their space stations. The materials were just too expensive, and the process took too long. A ship's grav drive was more efficient in the short term. However, over centuries of use, the elevator would use much less power to achieve the same volume of transport. It was another example of the long-term approach that people used to take, as opposed to the current mindset, which was decidedly short-sighted. It was a shift created by the advent of FTL. People had always suspected, at least once the significance of 299,792,458 meters per second was known, that some method of exceeding the speed of light was possible. Many theories of wormholes, space-time folding, alternate realities, and slipstreams were put forward and attempted. In the end, the workable form of faster-than-light travel encapsulated many of the ideas behind some of those theories, though it turned out to be much harder to harness than originally hoped. Before FTL, each star system was isolated from the rest of humanity, but once a trip between two stars was reduced to a matter of weeks and not centuries, everything changed. Traveling to an uninhabited star to mine asteroids was something that could be easily achieved, and people's attitude toward conservation and efficiency disappeared within a century. Helen injected a long yawn into Sarah's thoughts. Enough already. We get it. You yearn for the good old days. I don't really miss the days. Just wish people could appreciate the way things used to be. Helen didn't agree. You just miss your people. This isn't your world, and you know it. It is now. It has to be. Helen didn't respond. It was an old conversation, one they performed out of habit more than a real expectation of change. She walked through the freight deck's main corridor, poking her head into various holds, ensuring that everything was secure and ready for departure. The familiar smell of deck cleaner and oil wafted past, and an unbidden memory of her first weeks on the ship came back. She and Flaherty had spent many a day hauling equipment through these halls and shafts back when they were first refitting Sabrina. It had been long days and longer nights, but she was proud of what they had built. Helen flashed the date of her memory over her vision, and she was surprised to see that it had been just over ten years ago. Somewhere in the last few months, she had passed her ten-year anniversary with Sabrina without marking the occasion. No wonder the ship had been a bit snippy of late. Sarah chided Helen for not reminding her of the occasion, nor for cluing her in on the cause of Sabrina's poor temper. I was unaware you were interested in marking anniversaries with A.I. Helen was unrepentant. What are you talking about? Sarah replied. We always celebrate our anniversary. Helen inserted the emotion of mild surprise, followed by a pout into Sarah's mind. I thought that was just for me. Sarah laughed, and her avatar stuck her tongue out at Helen. Don't give me that. I'm not some little girl that you can twist around your ephemeral finger anymore. Helen didn't respond, and Sarah let out a long sigh. For being one of the most advanced AI in the inner stars, Helen could certainly be childish. 
Sometimes I think Sabrina is rubbing off on you, Sarah said to her one-time mentor and guardian. I resent that, Helen retorted. Just because the ship's AI can't deal with the fact that I am her superior in every way doesn't mean I have to dumb it down. You're superior to most planet administration AI we run into, but you don't go out of your way to make them feel inferior, Sarah responded, mildly surprised to be the one to advocate maturity in their relationship. Maybe I could be more accommodating for our dear Sabrina, Helen eventually responded. Glad to hear it. Now I have to figure out how to make it up to her, Sarah said. Make what up? Helen asked innocently, and Sarah let out an audible scream. She completed her review of the freight deck and took the aft ladder shaft up to the crew deck. When she first bought Sabrina, the ship had lifts for reaching each deck, but Sarah had removed all but one of the conveniences. Shafts were faster and still worked when the ship was under fire and conserving energy. Nothing to do with how you would like to climb ladders in front of the men on the ship, Helen suggested. I do it to Cheeky, too. Sarah smiled to herself as she stepped onto the crew deck. Funny, I thought you preferred it when she did it to you. The ladder was across from the galley, and she stepped in to find Thompson and Flaherty eating their supper. She saw that it was nearly the end of second shift. Most of the crew would be calling it a night soon. Evening, Captain. Thompson sat around a mouthful of his sandwich. Flaherty looked at her, nodded, and went back to his meal. Hey, guys. Sarah smiled at them as she poured a cup of coffee and hunted for fresh cream. Thompson and Flaherty made an effective and efficient team when it came to managing the ship's cargo. Neither of them talked much and managed to communicate just about everything with grunts and gestures. They didn't even use the link to talk. Sarah had checked the logs. Sarah doctored her coffee up just the way she liked and bid them good night before taking the corridor to the bow, then climbing the ladder that led to the top deck. This was the smallest deck on the ship, containing only the bridge forward and a small observation lounge aft. The lounge had a magnificent view of the light flare from the engines when they were under heavy thrust, and Sarah had often sat back there, gazing out at it as the ship cruised through space. Cargo was still on the bridge, readying the reports Sarah had to sign before they could depart. Cheeky was also at her console, having added a tight halter top and tiny skirt to her ensemble. She yawned and stretched as she stood. You just had to make a final course alteration right before bed, she complained. I had to plot it out and refile with system traffic control. Sorry about that. I didn't think you'd already filed the report. Sarah apologized. When else was I going to do it? When I was sleeping? Cargo laughed. I thought you had gotten all of your sleeping in on your shore leave. Cheeky stuck her tongue out at the man. Jealous. Cargo couldn't help it as his eyes strayed down to the bold black print across Cheeky's chest. It read, got milk? He sighed wistfully. I might be. Really? Cheeky asked. No, not really. Cargo grinned. You're such a tease, Cheeky said, as she turned and left the bridge. I'm a tease? He murmured softly as she left. You are, you know, Sarah said. How so? I don't flirt. I just do my job. Exactly. Sarah smiled as she shuffled the plaz she had to sign into order. You're totally unflappable. It's the ultimate come on. I'm going to start the pre-warm-up checklist so things will be ready in the morning. See? Always back to business with you. Do you want to do it? Cargo turned, half rising out of his chair. Heck no. I've been up for 30 hours already. Cargo nodded and sat back down. Coburn, like many stations, required a full warm-up and test of all ship systems before undocking. The warm-up had to take place four hours before departure and Cargo was taking the third watch to run the sequence at 0500 hours. She turned to leave the bridge when Nance, the ship's bio, appeared in her mind. I just wanted to let you know, take short showers for the next while. I know how you like to luxuriate for an hour or more. Even though she was looking at Nance's mental avatar, the bio engineer still wore a thick, tight has suit. 
Whereas Cheeky showed every inch of skin she could manage, Nance was the opposite, rarely showing any skin at all, even virtually. What's up? Sarah asked. I have the stink of a hundred drunks to wash off. The bio scowled. Well, let's just say that you don't want to come down to environmental until I clean up. The regulator on tank nine malfunctioned, and a line blew, contaminated all sorts of shit with, well, shit. Was it that one you bought at Rattlescar? Sarah asked. Yeah, I knew I shouldn't have, but it was such a good deal, the bio replied. Ripped off at Rattlescar again. You should know better. Nance's avatar nodded sullenly, and Sarah laughed. Well, I'll let you get to it. Can I at least have ten minutes? Nance nodded. Yes, but a second over and I'm switching it to full cold. Is that any way to treat your captain? Do you want to come down here and clean up? Nance retorted. Okay, okay, ten minutes, got it. Nance disappeared from her vision as Sarah slid down the ladder to the third deck. She walked quietly past the crew cabin doors to her quarters at the end of the corridor. She palmed the door open with a yawn and entered her outer office where she handled the ship's business. It was the standard utilitarian sort expected of a captain. Her various certifications hung on the wall, and a large oak desk dominated the small space. She laid the departure plaz sheets on its surface and pulled up hollow of each one. This was the part about captaining a starship she liked least. She was near finishing up and getting ready to peel off her leather when Cargo called her over the link. Still up, Captain? Barely. Hate to bother you with this but you're the only other one awake. Cade's boys are down at the hatch with that last shipment. Despite his words, Cargo's tone didn't carry any apology. Grumbling that she should have told Thompson to have himself or Flaherty wait up for it, she pulled her jacket back on and slid down the ladders to the freight deck. At the holds opening to the station dock, two men were waiting with a large crate on a gravity pad. They were looking nervous and just a bit twitchy. Either they had some bad drugs in their systems, or Cade was foisting something pretty damn dangerous on her. One of the men spoke up as soon as he spotted her. Permission to come aboard? He asked. Sarah granted it, and the two men all but ran onto the ship and moved out of direct sight from dock traffic, the cargo container following them on its float. So what does the mark have for me today, boys? Sarah asked, none too pleased about the late hour or the obviously illegal contents of the crate. What am I sticking my neck out for this time? Most cargo that Mark had her run was just semi-illegal, either okay in the system where she was picking up or delivering to, just not both, or some stopping point along the way. There also had been the odd shipment that was illegal no matter where they were. This one had that feel. The man who had asked permission to board grinned in what he probably thought was a winning fashion. It really wasn't. It's nothing to worry about, just a little something that Cade wants. I don't care about that, Sarah said as she reached over and snatched the bill of lading from him. I care what this says it is. Scanning the pad, she found that the crate purported to contain a prize racing hound in a hollow sim. The dog thought he was in a regular kennel with other dogs for companionship and humans feeding him. The reality was just a crate with a feeding system, but he wouldn't know the difference and would be better for it. That really what's in there? Sarah didn't bother to hide her skepticism. Yeah, the dog's not as special as who used to own it. The man grinned again, and Sarah held up her hand. Yeah, sure. I really don't want to know more. She signed off on the delivery. Any need to open it and check it out? The men went rigid and hastily assured her that the dog would be fine and there was no need to check it out. That clinched it for Sarah. She would definitely have to check this cargo out once she was underway. If it had any type of tamper seal, she'd make up some excuse for it later. Once it was secured in the four-port hold, she informed cargo that the delivery had been made and stowed. Then she closed the main cargo hatch in the auxiliary personnel port. Cargo confirmed the seal from the bridge and checked it off the pre-warm-up list. Get some rest, Captain. Gonna be a long day tomorrow, Cargo advised. Cargo? Now you've gone and jinxed it. 